Welcome to the Food Envy podcast, where we're investigating the visual side of food. Today, I'm here with top chef and great guy, Nick Gaylor. Hey, Nick. Thank you. Yeah. That's a little bit too much, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Top guy, you've allowed me to come and do this today, which is brilliant. Yeah, I think... I don't know when we... Did you first... When did we first meet at the start of the Miller? Well, I was just thinking about that. We've got some photos we're going to go through later. Brilliant. From 2015. Can you believe it was the first shot we did at the Miller? I know. So it'll be interesting to see how much maybe your plating technique has changed over that time. Yeah, and the connection was made, Ned, wasn't it? Because was, was there a friend of ours? That's right. A friend of ours from Maiden we were there? From the Rue Scholarship, I think it was. That's right. I can't remember exactly. No, I can't. Um, but I know the email came and I was like, well, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, she very kindly put us in, in contact. And um, yeah, that was one of, the, sort of one of the first practice shoots I had. And to be honest, one of the show, photos I'm going to show you later was the front page of my website for about seven years because I absolutely love it. It's got everything that I see in food photography that I love. You know, it's got... You'll have to remind me of it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll show, you, I'll show you in a bit, actually. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that we have worked on loads of photo and video projects together. So what I really wanted to get from you is, obviously, your food tastes great. I can attest to that. What makes or what inspires you to create a beautiful plate of food? Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? And it, it def it's a difficult question. Yeah. And it, how many layers can you go into probably quite a lot i suppose if i go off track please mm. come back and mm. hop me yeah but but to, to start with you've got to be really really comfortable and proud of the ingredients that you start with mm. see and then when you strip that back down you then you're then thinking about how do i want this to look to the customer and what can i afford in terms of crockery oh interesting crockery. Okay. so the plate absolutely and i'm yeah. forks yeah i mean that's your canvas i suppose yes yeah, it's foundation isn't it yeah absolutely and i've always been very he i've been very lucky throughout my career to work with fantastic front of house team i very much see my job as putting the food onto the plate mm. and when it goes out of the kitchen that's it okay that's it so the relationship from that point to the customer is on the front of house team okay you know and 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 we will talk them through and influence them as much as we can with our passion so that they care about it as much as we do. Okay. Um, you've got to start with the right products and the right ingredients so you're comfortable and confident. I think in the very early stages of my career, God, I'm a bit getting a bit old, a bit definitely greyer, mate. A bit old, a bit long in the tooth. Yeah, I know. I that's both of us, Nick. But it, food styles change. Mm -hmm. I love modern influences. I was loving modern influences 20 years ago when I started. Yep. They're different. They were different then to what they are now. And has the importance changed? Uh, has the importance of how, how I don't like the term, but Instagrammable a plate of food is? Do you think there's more? 100%. More, okay. 100% for, for most people that are within the industry. Mm. It's very obvious to me, food that's plated for Instagram mm. and food that's plated to go to a customer. They're two completely different things. Okay. You don't even necessarily need to cook some food. If you want to make it look nice, if you want to keep the colours as mm. vibrant and as fresh as they possibly can be looking, I would describe that as Instagramming type oh, yeah. food. Again, I've been lucky enough to work with the odd um, food artist type people that have contracts with some of the big companies, and they might work on like Waitrose magazine or something. Yep. You know, and 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 they'll talk to me about how they create colour. You know, broccoli is a good example of that. They won't cook it; they'll just rub some oil on it and look okay. raw in a in a plate of food yep but let's go back in going back to my own influences and styles mm. it develops as you go as you as you go through your career i think you put less on the plate the longer you've been cooking is that due yeah. to conf us yes okay. due to confidence i think you look at influences and you are more influenced mm. the less experienced you are definitely yeah. I suppose, in essence, to start with, we're probably looking at those elements of carbohydrate, vegetable, protein, source in a very simplistic way. Do you know what I mean? Have I got those elements on my plate and can I make them look fairly neat and tidy? Um, God, it's very difficult to think about some of the first foods that, and, and some of the first restaurants I worked in because the old grey matters. Mm. Fate. That's okay. I mean, certainly what, what made me realise how much styles have changed, maybe not so much in your sphere, but with cookbooks. I look back at, say, Jamie Oliver's cookbook from 15, 20 years ago, and the photography and the styling is clearly not a hugely important part of, of, of the recipe, possibly. Whereas if you look at them now, it's almost a thing that inspires people to go and buy it and try it, isn't it, really? So from, from that point of view, 
from a photography point of view, I've really noticed that change. And I was just wondering from the technical point of view from restaurants, because obviously visuals is always important in food, how that's changed. So for example, if, if it was 50-50 when you first started in terms of when you're designing a plate, the aesthetic to the taste, would you say that balance has changed? Yeah, it's difficult. Again, it would depend on who you're talking to. Okay. For a chef, it's all, for me, yeah. we'll always start with the quality and what yeah. it's going to taste like. Yes. You, however, you eat with your eyes before anything goes near your mouth. And if it looks appetizing mm. and you've created something that's very delicate, arty, pretty, mm. all of those words, people will probably go, well, oh, look at that. You know, and you may well, mm. a little bit of saliva may appear in your mouth. <laughs> Are you ready to start eating? Your yeah, it certainly does. Or lunch. Yes. Um, yeah, just going back to the cookbook things, really interesting point. There was a time when cookbooks were not picture led just yes. at all absolutely and they were just recipe led mm. i think one of the big the big changes and i can't it's going to do my head in that i can't remember the name of the photographer but was marco's white heat book okay was one of the first books yep where it was speak brilliant spiels of marco mm. you know bemoaning his customers and talking about people coming to his restaurant and treating it like a living room <laughs> and upsetting his wife and yeah. the rest of it um but the photography might be bob somebody okay the photography was the key part of the book and it was one of the first sort of big influences okay. in the in the cookbook change and you're talking mm. that's marco at harvey's time so you're talking wow. a long time ago. so did that have an impact on you absolutely yeah i've got i've got it and fortunately i've been fortunate enough to meet him and he signed it for me oh wow. brilliant well, i haven't got a hard copy i've only got a paperback copy but it's yeah. still brilliant and i have it somewhere yeah. in one of i don't know whether it's at home or in a pile of books somewhere yeah. else but um yeah and then from there you know, you then go to people like Gordon. I think one of his first ones was called Formulas for Flavor, yep. something like that, or Passion for Flavor. Mm. Fabulous book. Um, and, and I was encouraged. When I got into better quality dining, My chef, the chefs always said to me, you've got to be looking at what other people do. The Essence books by David Everett, Matthias, beautiful books. And you yep. look at the vivid colors and the styles of the food and you think, oh, it's like being in their kitchen with them yep. without being in their restaurant and you know young young chefs you, you might not have a, an enormous amount of money to be tripping around but a 10 15 pound book gets yep. you in their mindset absolutely and i think i probably would look at the pictures before you before you would go and have a look and see if the recipes yep yeah um but yeah the cookbook thing i mean and now cookbooks are t to a penny you know, we were offered deals at the Miller for cooking books and I just didn't want to do one because I didn't feel like, I mean, whatever, I didn't know what was going to happen in the future, but I didn't feel like our journey was complete and I felt didn't want to document it at that point. But I've got a lot of friends that have got fabulous cook. Yeah. Well, I can tell you as well from first-hand first experience, the amount of investment in time it takes to do a cookbook as well, yeah. you know, just because it's it's you, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's a bit of a cliche to you want a plate, but a cookbook really is because it you know, it's every single one of your recipes, you know, you've got to look through the images and all that kind of stuff. You probably need a member of staff with you. You probably yeah. need somebody with you to help you yeah. design the food, plate the food, make sure it's exactly as you want. You've probably got to do two or three of yep. each dish at the very minimum. Mm. I, I was in the in the job I had before at the Crown, before I came over to the to the Miller. Yep. I was party to some of the work they put into the dinner by Heston Book. And it was relentless, mm. relentless for like nine months. Yeah. You know, constant over, and that those books are, phen, you know, phenomenal in terms of the pictures. Yeah, yeah they're, they're art, aren't they? They're art, yeah. Yeah, they really yeah. are. And I, I, I think Ashley did give me a book called Studio Something. Okay. That was, it was a, it was a cookbook mm. with no recipes in it. Yep. And it was, you opened it up and it went, it went that way and then that way. And you just yeah. turn, and it was just beautiful, artistic yeah. food pictures. Yeah. Um, really important and great, great for everybody, great for everybody to be able to enter the world of a chef through yep. a fabulous picture. Yeah, especially to that degree of it, which is not home cooking, but it's aspirational. It's, Absolutely. You know, it's, it really is that inspiring people to want to want to do it. Isn't Absolutely. It? And I mean, the high, I mean, the home market is pr probably sells greater than the, the more ones that are maybe aimed more professionally. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned. You mentioned Jamie Oliver, but if I ever went to any of my family's ha homes, you're talking like Lorraine Pascal. Yep. I don't even didn't even know who Lorraine Pascal was. Yep. Well, I was like, oh, follow this. Yeah. Place. I'm like, yeah. what? Yeah. Who's this person? Mm. Um, and I'm sure there's a there's an abundance of others. Yeah. Really important those visuals. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely agree. So, so we talked about the plate, the foundation. Let's go back to how you 
yeah. design. I mean, do you go do you go into the details of actually drawing something out? Do you sketch something? Do you work? How do you work on the balance of what? So I would say there have been times when I've been able to allow myself the time to do that. Okay. So concept essentially. Mm. What are the concepts of dishes? What are you thinking about doing? I've actually done a little bit of that here in the current environment because we're not a day to day restaurant. Yep. But we are trying to plan for that and we're thinking about whether we might be able to do that so mm. if i come up with something or we've made something for a one-off and i think actually that's that's really good or that's a good combination of food mm. that'll get scribbled down and maybe this is how we can plate it over time and working in different environments that's allowed me to understand food shape food style yep and that influences how you put things onto plates. Mm. For me, I always start with whatever shape that plate is. I will always go to the middle of that plate as a start mm -hmm. point. Doesn't necessarily mean something will something physical will be in that middle point, but naturally your eye is drawn to the middle of something. Yep. You don't look at a, you don't look at a you know a piece of art and look mm. at the top right hand corner and go, well, that's really interesting. Yeah. Up in the top right hand corner, you look right at the middle, and it's exactly the same with a plate of food. Especially if you're on a circle plate. Yeah. Because naturally you're, you can see that shape and you go to the middle. So if you've got a big pile of something and then you bring some height in over to one side, mm. personally, I always think that looks a little odd. I could, I agree. I couldn't agree with you more. I did a shoot not that long ago with a brilliant chef, beautiful looking food. And, and I don't know whether it's a photographer's eye, but it's funny that you say it as well. A lot of it was positioned off center and and it just, there was just something about it that didn't look quite right. A bit unnatural. It was unbalanced. I think if that's you, what it was. If you think about our, if you think about the things that are beautiful within mm. nature, the yeah. things that we are attracted to, yeah. they are centric. Mm. You know, a, a, a log of a tree, yep. you know, it's got mm. concentric circles yes. working its way out. There aren't that many things that are abstract. No. I'm not saying there's not a place for abstract. And there are some very, very talented chefs yeah. that create, create fantastic, messy looking food. Yes. The trick, the trick for me is they've been doing it for a long, <laughs> long, long time, and they understand how to draw your in your interest through color, height. It's the, it's the same with photography. You've got to understand the rules to break balls, right? Yes, and I think that's exactly. very true. You can't just kind of get lucky, you, and you've got to know what you're doing. You're absolutely right. Years that's, of experience. I think that's possibly a slight downfall of the Instagram. Yeah. In people will look at high end guys. You know the. The guys that have really got time to think about their plating are the guys that are in two star, three star kitchens mm. and can afford mm. the time yeah. to spend thinking about plate design. Yes, I've drawn that dish up. I I, I remember looking at Sat posted on Instagram one, you know, little it's got a little scrapbook and there's little pictures of mm. dish and we we're, we're gonna come up with this one and then and it was in concept two and a half years ago and then he takes a picture yeah. of it because they've worked it through and you know, not that many environments can help with that and, and it's a it's a problem for maybe less experienced chefs because they're like, I want to make my food look like that. Yeah. And then when they do, it's a car crash. Yeah. Instead of this puff and abs, understanding and, and, and kind of getting to know. And to be honest with you, I've, I've been out to places and mm. you, know, you know when you're going to get something that's probably really beautiful. Yeah. Due to the fact that they've probably been practicing a long time, which is what it is, yeah. you know, against people who feel like, They've got it, but perhaps we need to spend a bit more time understanding. Yeah. Do you find you do that? Because again, there's so many similarities between photography and food, but the, when you see something, you reverse engineer it. Yeah. And and try and work out what they don't. Because I do that all the time with photography and light. 100%. All that kind of stuff. 100%. And, and with food, obviously, it goes into greater depth than just yeah. how it looks. Of course, yeah. Because obviously, you'll look, you know, in my, my brain is going, I always say to the youngsters, it's market research going out. You go out. Can you do that? Do you understand how they've done that? Yeah. If the answer to the thing is no, then that's great because you're still learning. And then we're all learning yeah. all the time, but don't stop. Yeah, in terms of the plating, if you're lucky, you've got a budget that will allow you to buy something really pretty or something nice. Mm. Um, or you can have something bespokely made mm. or you go into some of the amazing French potteries. Um, you know, but again, that tends to only be those restaurants that have got really high level income. You know, or are super successful and generating lots of money and are prepared to put money back into that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, the touch and feel of a nice plate, cutlery is exactly the same. It's got to match. How irritating is it? You've got a beautiful plate of food. You put your knife on the side of the plate and the knife just falls into the plate because it's <laughs> rounded or it's got yeah. some funky shape to it. Yeah. It's irritating. Yeah. All those things have to be thought about. Yeah. Um, you know, nothing annoys me more when I can't put a knife on the side of a plate and it, and it falls in the food. 
it's amazing the details you notice, isn't it? You yeah. know, when you when you understand and have worked in it for a long time, yeah. those small differences. Because I'm not sure I would necessarily notice that. I have to say, and 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 you know, I'm in and around the industry, but nowhere near to the level of, of chefs and you and stuff. But sure, it is it is it is wonderful that that extra level of detail that gives you an extra understanding of the effort and the creativity and and things like that that go that go into what you guys do. Absolutely. Do you want to be trying to push a knife through a hard bit of butter, even if it looks beautiful? Mm. No, mm. you don't. And that comes from understanding. You know, it's they've got to be at it's got to be at room temperature so that it is easy. So you're not focused on that. You're focused on the quality yeah. of that product yeah. that's been put in front of you, so you can just enjoy the experience of quality. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, going back because I know we, uh, we 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 go off a little bit there. Um, so start with the plate. Yep. And we've talked a bit about balance. Where does your brain go next? sort of? Yeah, so so as I said, most things are drawn to the centre. It doesn't necessarily mean something's going to go directly into the centre of the plate. Balance definitely needs to be there. And I always like to leave, I always like to not fill right to the edge of the plate. Mm. We've done dishes where it's been a little bit more messy, but I'm still starting in the centre. Yep. I'll think about the main elements of the dish. So if you have got something that's potato based and it's a it's a larger physical element that's going to be going onto the plate you've got to be careful about where that's going to go and then how the rest of the components match up i like to see the components on my tray prepped cooked ready mm -hmm. sitting resting ready for me to put on the plate. i like to have a quick look at it before i then transfer that onto there even if i've done it a hundred times yep because it will generally be different what's fascinating with plating is how I see something mm. is completely different to one of my other guys or girls. Yep. And again, experience has taught me that I have to be careful mm. about how we play. And if I make it too tricky mm. and I can do it, mm. if the next person can't do it and I'm asking them to play because I'm helping somewhere else or I'm not in the kitchen, yep. then the food is not the same as it was before. And that's only a downward spiral for me. You, mm. The food has got to be the same yep. consistency yeah. every single time it goes out. So again, that's tricky and that can take a bit of practice. Another funny little one is I'm left-handed. How oh, is that right? My wife, my sous chef, is right-handed. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I put my Rocher down mm. and pull my spoon away from it, I've got a flat side coming down this side. Mm. My right-handed mm. sous chef puts it down that side and the flat side's down that side. That's fascinating. Well, I need to consider that. Mm. And I need to consider whether actually I need to put my Rocher down there and then spin the plate round yep. so that it would be the same for the right-hander. I see. Which you can do. Yeah. But again... Without thinking about it, you you don't know that, and that's investing time. In terms of the general makeup mm. of, of a dish, if you've got some lovely vegetables and some protein, and then most things usually have a sauce. We split a lot of sauces these days with oils and flavoured oils to mm. give a really interesting visual. That's always been done, by the way. You know, yeah. fats have always been put into sauces. Going back to the Escoff, you know, the Ritz and the Escoffier mm. times, and you know, we some dishes we will completely finish. Mm. Some dishes we know that we want that the the perfect visual. I don't want a, the perfect visual in front of me. I want the front of the house team to do that with the customers. So the sauces will come in the jug and they'll pour at the table. Table uh, sauces, yeah, yeah. So that so there's a differentiation there between between finishing plating and, and what happens at the end. In terms of design, it really does depend on what you're cooking. Mm. It depends on shape, yep, size, texture. Whether you want any height, height's really important in plating food. Mm. If you're plating into a bowl in particular, do you want everything to be down very flat in the base of the bowl? Probably not. And in a nice bowl mm. to build food up so that yep. you've got some height off of it. Yep. Well, that if you're going to build food that's got a ha got height, you've got to have the, a dish that's capable of doing that. You don't want to be squashing everything <laughs> that's in the bottom. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so so it varies depending on... It, on what you're what you're what you're cooking what you're yeah. plate. i always think height's so important again from a photography angle it just looks impressive absolutely and i think you know as a non-chef it just technically looks harder do you know what I mean? yes. when i try and do something like that at home it falls down it topples because i haven't probably done the basics of like you just said um building from the bottom building and, you know all that yeah your stuff you know so it's it's one of those things that i always think looks really impressive yeah so i like to see it yeah i mean and it i think it, it comes a heck of a lot back to confidence yes a lot of plates now, in the plates that I will create now, I would say are probably far more simplistic with less ingredients mm. on them than maybe I was doing 10 years ago. Okay. Maybe. 
Um, be interesting to see that old picture. <laughs> so I do flick back through some of them yeah. sometimes and think, oh yeah, that was quite a good dish, wasn't yeah. it? But then a good dish to me is not necessarily a good dish in terms of selling or for the customer. Yeah. Um, you can go out to places and I can pick through a menu and think, oh, that's a sh- that's a chefy thing. I'm having mm. the chefy thing, mm. you know. And you'll go out with a group of people and I'll be like, I bet the rest of them don't order that. But you can pick out some mm. of the chefy things. Obviously, I want to eat the chefy things, yeah. the nice things. But yeah, interesting. The, the interesting how different people perceive visual. Yeah. Well, I think that comes down to it being an art form, doesn't it? You know, that people yeah. do. It's subjective. People have different opinions. Yeah. You know, with with the advent of social media, it's nobody's allowed an opinion anymore, are they? You know, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, I, I completely agree, and I think that's, that's fascinating what you say about confidence and less is more. That that really interests me. Like you're saying that you just have more confidence that you can that you what you're doing is the best. It looks brilliant, and that's enough. You can yeah. spot the less confident chefs now, or perhaps less experienced, because I wouldn't want to knock people down. They, mm. You know, lots of people create lots. Yeah. More recently, we've we've had the the, the increase of the commercial suppliers that grow the little micro herds. Yes. Well, they've always been around. Mm. For me, when I look at the micros, I've got a taste and they've actually got a taste of something because some of them don't. Yeah. But you can usually see when a chef's throwing a bit of red vein sorrel all over everything and you're thinking, well, why have you, why is the red vein sorrel going on there? Don't put it on there. It might mm. be the eighth, ninth, eleventh element going onto that dish. Yeah. Oh, well, I just thought a little bit of salad garnish will go well on there. Yeah, but... Yeah. You need to. <laughs> yeah. Could you take three or four more things back off of yeah. there? Um, and and what you've created and cooked is still absolutely delicious. Mm. Um, and you see that a lot on Instagram. Yeah, you see that a lot. There are specific of those micros that are more readily available. Mm. They're the ones that turn up on all the dishes, rather than the concept of a dish. Yep. That may well then have something that perfectly flavours with it. And to go a level on from that, obviously, big influences now from all the food that we can gather in and around us. Mm amazingly lucky here mm. hopefully this project we can deliver further with here but there's all sorts of wild food all over the golf course yep um and there are sorrels and those sorts of things well in the right and the elderflower right now isn't it yeah um you know which is which is lovely with elderflower jam all those sorts of things delicious things but you know the concept of the dish if it works all together and when you're eating it and then you can create something a little bit more beautiful yeah obviously because i know your food relatively well sure um how important is seasonality to plating and creativity and things like that? Is that that's something you're quite... Yeah, I suppose it's a link between the plate, the chef, and, and where you are in the country, where yeah. you are in the world. It's one of those words that the local, the seasonal, people jump on board with mm. a long time ago, but perhaps didn't really deliver it. Again, there are certain places around that that really are able to deliver that because they work very closely with a farm or they're lucky enough to have a farm as part mm. of their setup. I think understanding how and where our food comes from and gets to us is important from a from a commercial chefing point of view. Mm. Seasonality works because bar the first week of everything coming into season, you get better value. Yep. There's always a clam bar. Because <laughs> everyone wants to get it on their plate, yep. get it on their Instagram. Um, but as soon as that peak, happens then you get better value for money yeah um and that makes sense in terms of commercial awareness in terms of getting the food onto the plate i think depending on your environment if you're lucky to have a, a wildy sort of environment that you're cooking in and a lot of a lot of brilliant restaurants are in wonderful places i'm yep. thinking of like places like up in the lakes and that where they've got loads of fantastic restaurants because it's beautiful yep if you're sitting looking at a fantastic scene or some scenery you know, you want to feel the connection with yeah. where you are through into your plating. And you then you've also got to be clever enough and careful enough to mm. depict that Yeah, in a play of food. Obviously, we talked about maybe Marco Pierre White being one of the people that inspir- inspired, <laughs> inspired you yeah. in, their book, in his book and as a chef. Who sort of nowadays is kind of pushing the boundaries of plate design? Um, more plate design than, than possibly, you know, the... Uh, the, the, cooking. The, the cooking itself because yeah. let's just assume it's going to be good yeah who who really is sort of inspiring you pushing boundaries a lot of influence we, we've we've taken a lot of influences recently from from some of the japanese food which has been wonderful for our food mm. again quite simplistic they 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 take key ingredients yeah great ingredients great key ingredients mm. that are super super quality mm. and then they don't mess around with them too mm. much and that that is really the essence of where my brain is now People that I keep, people that I, 
that I follow and look, I mean, God, the Instagram's full of chefs. Mm. And really excitingly, each year comes round, two or three more, four more emerge. Yeah. Um, there's a young lad who was in the Heinz head when I was over there called Alex Payne. He's yep. now the head chef at the Tudor Pass mm -hmm. at Great Fosters. We another one. Near Egham. Yep. Um, and they've been down there, him he and his team. He's gone away and done his learning, with as you do. And, yep. and they create really pretty looking plates of food. Mm -hmm. But they're in a wonderful environment where they only do 16, 18 covers a night. So a lot of their dedication can go into making that beautiful looking plate of food. Yep. I really like uh, Gareth Ward up at Enesia. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been going for quite a long time. His food is a big, long tasting menu. Mm -hmm. So you will have an element of protein with a sauce mm. or a ketchup and mm. that's it mm. per plate and I, I always i find that intriguing and interesting if you're working in a restaurant that delivers that sort of food is that confidence again that sounds like that super confidence. Confidence. Yeah. super confidence um and that's confidence that gareth will have grown out of years of mm. training and learning and then getting the opportunity to go and do it for himself mm. who else do we look at johnny who i used to work with who's at trivet now they they've got an a la carte more an a la carte, of an a la carte type yeah. dining operation. So um, instead of it being a tasting menu where you've got maybe those smaller individual portions, perfect perfect bits and pieces, you've got a plate of, more of a plate of food. Yeah. Um, and their 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 plating is always. I mean, obviously that is linked and comes out of the fat duck style. Okay. Um, that style of restaurant is very specific um, and very 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 careful with mm. making sure everything is exactly right all the time but yep. if on the a la carte yeah johnny at trivet their food's lovely and the way it looks again they're lucky they probably got links into some of the really high-end crockery mm -hmm. suppliers um it tends to i tend to follow the guys that i aspire to a little bit okay you know um i do the same with dog i yeah. and when i say aspire i don't necessarily mean in terms of how i cook mm. more about how they've how they've create how they created their careers. Yep. How their careers have developed. Perhaps I've been lucky enough to brush shoulders with them a yeah. couple of times. Perhaps they've been to see me yeah. and enjoyed some of the bits and pieces that we do. I've got a really yep. good friend, Tony Parkin. He's not in the UK anymore. He's over in Ireland. His food is fantastic. Um uh, mm. where with it. I, I, I know Tony. Yeah. Yeah, Tony yeah. Tony's a really brilliant guy because spade to spade with Tony, mm. but he's he's got whatever it is, mm. you know. When I first came across him there, and I was camping somewhere down in down in Sussex, and he was with Graham and Garrett down yep. at the West House, is it? Mm. Okay, we were just like, oh well, let's go. We were just literally like, should we go after dinner? We went, mm. and I was like, this is brilliant. Yeah, and the food was really interesting. Yeah. There was elements where things were on plates and the waiters came out and did a, did a bit of finishing, mm -hmm. a bit of grating of foie gras, that sort of stuff. You yep. know, and all of that theatre mm. really creates interest on the plate. I agree. Um, yeah, Tony's food's brilliant. And he's a really good guy as well. Yeah. Um, very honest with each other. <laughs> well, it helps, doesn't it, really? You get yeah. a creative endeavour, you, you kind of need that that honesty of that's rubbish. or you know, when, And then when you get a brilliant or you know something positive, it actually means something, doesn't it, really? Because yeah, again, absolutely. getting a bunch of likes on Instagram doesn't really mean that it's good or bad. It's a funny thing, the Instagram. Funnily enough, the, wor the, the, pit the worst pictures I've put on Instagram mm. get greater interest. Mm. In my opinion, the worst yeah. pictures or the worst dishes yes. seem to get greater interest yeah. than maybe some of the things that I think are beautiful. <laughs> the other thing that's fascinating is, and a real hats off to these guys that create beautiful cookbooks, mm. you can create a really amazing plate of food. And when you take a photo of it, you're like, why does that look so rubbish? Yeah. It looks amazing right there, and I want to eat it. You need a professional, that's what you need. Uh, <laughs> is that right? <laughs> See, is that right? That's what you need. Well, it's funny because I mean, some things, some things photograph well, some things don't photograph well. Again, you know, when I work with chefs, actually having an eye for 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 telling the story on the plate actually does help, so you can see everything. Because sometimes things will sure. be covered or what have you. Sure. So, I mean, those things can sure can impinge the the photography side of it, if you sure. should. I mean, as opposed to what it looks like when you dine, because you know it is different, like the angle you look at it from and things like that. Sure, it can just make a difference. Yeah, I mean, most most restaurants, the angle that you look at it from, as you rightly say, when we mm. send food across the pass, we will send it to the waiters or waitresses. You know, I want them to put the food down in front of them the way I have just plated it. Yeah, that's really important. Nothing annoys me more where they touch the edge of the they touch the edge of the bowl and like, oh, it's a bit hot, and they spin it a little bit and put their hair around. I'm like, eh, eh. I want that to go to them like that. Yes, that's why we 
plated it like that, if you're just going to spin it around and put it down anyway, they're, yeah. they're not going to get the experience that we want them to have. Not that it's all about me, but I want my bit, as I explained earlier, yeah. my bit, when it goes out the door, that's all I can do yeah. um, to the best of my ability. Yeah. Well, again, I understand that because, again, it's your, it's your signature. People are coming a lot of the time to eat because it's you, right? So They are, yeah. It's important. Mary won't like us talking about that. <laughs> front of house are as important. No, they are, and they do create a whole experience. Yeah. You're absolutely right. The kudos of the chef and in the chef there and as the chef plated this and has yeah. been part of the cooking process, people do like. And you do, I think, style-wise, it's difficult. People always ask me about food style. I find that really difficult to explain. Yes. I'm probably modern British, mm. but my style is a combination of 20 years' worth of working with different people who might not describe themselves as modern, modern British. Yep. And that includes me being in a pub environment where 50% of our food is burgers and fish and chips. Yep. Still want that to look nice, you know, but it's with a bit of thought process behind it. Mm. You know, is that the right plate for a fish and chips to go on? Don't know. Is it or isn't it? Let's have a conversation about that. And if you've yeah. got the affordability, can we buy the right plate? For it? Moving on slightly. So yep. you're going to, you kindly agreed to plate a dish for us today. Yeah. What sort of techniques are we going to see? Well, so firstly, maybe just tell us what the dish is and then... So the dish is a concept dish, so quite interesting. So I'll probably cock it up a couple of seconds. <laughs> um, we've got some really lovely halibut that's been cured. We're only going to apply a little bit of heat to that. Mm. Um, Temperature is really important in food. Seasonal seasonally, we're going with some broad beans and some peas. Mm. I've got some daikon radish, so muli radish, big radish that would just have been braised a little bit, and we're just going to get some colour on the top of that. Then I've got some oils and a really lovely black sauce. So the concept of the dish was I've got a beautiful white plate. Yep. Black off of white. My fish is white. So my very icon's white. Nice and contrasty. Green mm. is the other element. I've then got some little bits and pieces of sea herbs to match in with the dish to make it pretty and tidy and neat. Yep. Um, what I've got is different shapes. Mm -hmm. So I've got peas and broad beans are obviously slightly rounded. Yep. I've got Slightly spiky looking sea herb. We've got some sea fennel. We've got some sea purslane, which is a bit softer, like a leaf. Uh, we've got some marsh samphire. Uh, we've got some, and the radish is cut into little rectangles, like little battles. Okay. The fish itself is kind of almost little squares mm -hmm. or a square piece. Um, and when that comes together on the plate, again, we'll start in the middle and we'll just try to build the garnish and build the plate up. Yep, and then we will finish with the sauce. I was thinking earlier on when we were talking, sourcing is an interesting one. Yep, you don't necessarily need to sauce after everything else is on the plate. Okay, some plates of food you want the sauce down on the bottom, and that's the start of your canvas, and that's where your food will go. Mm. We may well do that today because I don't want to pour something black because yep. we've created a fish velouté mm. or fish based fix stock based sauce, but we've added some squidding into it. Mm. It gives an interesting texture as well as the colour. Yeah. Um, interestingly, we had a tasting menu two or three months ago. I think we did a cod dish and it was a it was a take on black and white cod, which was done on GBM by Michael O'Hare about five, six, seven okay. years ago maybe. Yep. Um, brilliant dish. And it was basically a, a cod that was, I mean, it, the whole thing was like concept of black and white. Mm. I thought, let's try that. 50% of the people, that we had about 50 covers, 50% of the people were like, this is the, this is amazing. 50% mm. were like, oh, I'm a bit really by that. You know, okay. as you rightly said, subjectivity. Mm. The subjectivity around a piece of art or a piece of food or even down to the individual elements. Oh, I don't like, you know, I don't like cabbage. Just, well, hold on. Mm. How many varieties of cabbage are there? Do you like it cooked with some sweet and sour flavor? Mm. Do you like some spice putting into it? Do you like it crispy? Because... You can't tell me that people don't like fried cabbage because it's delicious yeah. and you fry it like crisps. Anyway, mm. I diverse. Um, yeah, so the dish, it's going to be a slightly messy plate. I think we're going to have the sauce on the bottom of the plate yep. and then we'll just build the rest up. Okay. And again, is this, because this sounds like, because it, if it was me, I probably wouldn't know what I was doing before I got there. But it sounds like you are, again, maybe confidence-wise, quite happy just to see how it goes and Very, see yeah. what works as you go, which is really interesting. Very happy in this environment. And that's yeah. perhaps something as a change, because we're not we're not open all day, every day here. I haven't got a menu where we're plating the same things over and over and over mm. and over and over. We are doing ad hoc dining yep. each month on different dates. And actually, it's that's taught me that to be confident... Mm. 
I'm not saying that the first one that we play up, I might look at it and go, no, I don't like that. Off the one side, we're going again. Mm. Um, but it's allowed me to be to feel to use the confidence and go, actually, yeah, I can create something that looks quite nice and yeah. looks interesting to people. Don't you know? There's the odd one where we're like, I'm not sure if I really <laughs> like what did I do? Do the elements of the dish yeah. work together? But again, you tend to learn that actually that is going to eat nice together, even if I can't make it mm. look particularly brilliant we're in an environment here where we're multifaceted with our dining so i would say probably 35 percent of my time right now is dedicated to dining dining the kind of food i personally really love lovely um so so i'm only dabbling into it so we'll, we'll see how we go today yeah. it's going to be interesting and i can talk we'll talk through it as we go. so i'm going to hand you my, my ipad and you can have a little look at some of the shots we did. Probably is, yeah, 2015, I think it was. So that's interesting because 20, we arrived at the Miller in 2014. When yeah. I got there, I was definitely using a collection of influences from other people that I'd worked with. Yeah. I reckon it took us about 18 months to two years. So if you just swipe, yeah. you'll, see some, you'll see some others. It took us about 18 months to two years for me to feel like me and the Miller had a style of food. Okay. And I think... I've always thought that the connection between your customers, your building, yep. and the share is a, it, that is that's how it that's how it should be, and that's how it works. It's not all about super duper share. Yes, it's about the whole thing, and yep. the environment. Yeah, they were snacks, weren't? They? That's right. It was, I think you called it British tapas, and we just ever heard of. And we just threw it all over the. We looked like we just threw it all over the floor. But in a but in a it's just a way. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. We spent a lot of time. Paddling around with that, right. interesting. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, lovely, mm. lovely. We actually still do some. This some. It's interesting. Some of those things have sort of followed, and mm. you know the hams and the pickles and the yeah. gherkins and stuff. Ah, right. Yes, I do remember that one. Mm. I mean, that from a. I guess from a placing point of view, that's not hugely interesting, but it just looks lovely, doesn't it? Really. Yeah, and you know what? I think we had again. This is an example of maybe the dish. Maybe we didn't plate it on that board. Mm. I think we did this for a photo. Mm. But confit and roasted shallots that have got some finishing with the sauces, yeah. with the sauce, beautifully caramelized by the look of that. I guess I didn't do that. It's probably somebody else. <laughs> that and was then, you, Nick. And then, the meat, and then the <laughs> meat that's been cooked properly yeah. and rested properly. Yeah. That's also come from the right supplier, beautifully aged, mm. all that sort of stuff. I think we were 35 days there. And then the right. sauce, I'm guessing, was a border lazy type sauce because our first sauces there were... Mm. Because I'd just come out of the fat duck environment. It was all very much bone marrow sauce and all that sort of stuff, right. which is delicious. And I was quite conscious that I didn't want to just go, oh, yeah, we'll just put bone marrow sauce or whatever. <laughs> Even though it's delicious. Yeah. And it was a Bordelaise based sauce, which is, you know, shallots and uh, Bordeaux red wine. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. And loads of salt. <laughs> you were, again, again, it kind of just looks good. I, that one's just a process. That That's just a, a nice photo y photo for me, if you know yeah. what I mean. I don't think we, I think that was definitely for a photo. We all yeah, oh, well, on there. I would have been knackered. Now these are probably the ones where. Uh, yeah, I remember that one. Interesting. Yeah, I mean it's just for, from a visual point of view, it's got it's got everything. I think you know that plate. We always used to call those the puke plate. So they were there by <laughs> their rack porcelain. So rack is um, UAE, I think, uh, porcelain supplier. Right, big, big, big supplier, but. Uh generally good quality okay generally good quality we always just cool on the puke plates and we used to struggle a bit to try and plate on them it's interesting that i put that on there because if i look at that now yeah i don't think i would have put that dish on that plate i wouldn't do that now i'd put that on a plate that was consistent yeah. color underneath i agree it, it doesn't need it because because it kind of mirrors the the bit yeah of the, the 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 elements doesn't yeah, it? yeah yeah what I particularly like is the, is the surface, though. Yes. You know, because that was shot on the... You, you wouldn't think it was just a tabletop, but it just glistened in the light. And it just... Yeah, yeah. They were really fascinating. Yeah, that was strawberries. It's kind of like a kind of broken down... Strawberry jelly, is it? Strawberries, basil, pink peppercorns, mm. pistachios, that sort of stuff. Sounds nice. And a tortellini. That's an interesting photo. See, now that must have been a very central... It was. I mean, it's also quite deceptive because that shot's so, so close. Yeah. With a macro lens. So it just focused on just one. I, I Lovely. Just, yeah. What yeah. earth was inside that? I can't remember. Yeah. Pickled, maybe some pickled lemons, some sort of cress. I'm guessing whatever was inside there mm. was the cress flavour. Okay. Wow, that's super close up as well. Isn't it? Yeah. But again, that's where it just sings the ingredients. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just put it in place, if you see what I mean, with the story of the nibbleboard and stuff like that. So that's more of a... 
photo when you tell a story. Tell the story, yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Just, just focusing on it. And that's because, and that's because we needed to tell the story mm. at that stage. Mm. We were telling the story for two to three years. We were constantly getting people saying, why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? Where's the pool table? Where's this? <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know we're here because we love the food. We care about the food product. We want mm. you to sit in the bar and eat. Uh, I remember that one. That's that's the one that, that was pheasant eggs. I can't remember the type of egg to be honest with you, but that for me has got everything. Uh, it's got the dynamism of the egg being broken, albeit clearly it's a still and you can't see it being broken. Uh, it's got depth through the image. It's got all the color. It's got texture. It's got it's got a lot. I think a truffle on there as well. Lovely, yeah, a bit of truffle, radish. Yeah. Yeah. And what those leaves were it looks like some some of the sort it looks like the sea vegetables bit of toast and yeah. yeah very nice mm. yeah i remember that interesting uh yeah okay and this was plated on not a plate that we were that was on a was uh, pumpkin one yeah it was i think it was but the, the 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 surface i remember this was just a metal sheet from something you would bake on in the kitchen I yeah 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 again it's just got lovely texture and it yeah and that helps against the yellow it looks like the old classic parmesani thing <laughs> that's it but again you know precise you know when you're cooking with food, it, the work's got to be precise. Yeah. You know, if it's not precise, you can't make things look nice. Yeah. You know, if you if you made that tortellini, but it wasn't sitting up, it was all flaccid and yeah. flat because yeah. you'd overcooked it or whatever, it just looks a mess. Yeah. Um, and you're never going to make a mess and look appealing to somebody. No. So it's a tough sell. Oh, there's the old puke plate done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be able to look at that the same way now. <laughs> I don't even know if I still got them. Quite a lot of the stuff has come here. Oh, what? So... Maybe I do. Maybe I do. That looks like some sort of fennel and bronze fennel and lobster and pink grapefruit. Yeah. And there's yeah. There you go. Set it up today. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. Well, well, so the the consistency that I would say in terms of the food and the plating there is the preciseness. I've got to know I'm key for things to be precise. Maybe some technical detail in terms of what you've actually made. A really nice sorbet or a jelly or a tortellini. Um, but yeah, the style of food. Yeah. Interesting. Those plates, actually, they were all, apart from the very precise strawberry one that was mm. a deliberate line of yep. food through the middle of the plate, mm. um, they were quite a bit more messy and a bit more dotted around. Again, that works, but you've got to have things within that that draw people's interest. Yeah. I remember a guinea fowl dish. I loved it. Loved guinea fowl. It was with some sort of lovagey mayonnaise as part of the sauce, so very green. Yep. Then we had some red, uh, pickled -y type of red onions mm. and some gnocchi. And some boudin blanc that's like a soft sort of white sausage, um, um, with all, and and that those bits were all dotted around, and the, the green element, the lovage, was left to go on, and at the end, the okay. sauce was on the plate, and then the mayonnaise went on. So when it went to them, mm. the mayonnaise hadn't puddled and run into the sauce, and by the time they got it, just a, like a whirly, you know, yep. so they could see that we'd been very precise about how we'd plated that dish. Mm. Um, interesting again, a technique that that I perhaps saw with one of my old head chefs who perhaps wasn't a messy plating chef, but one day had gone, actually, I sort of thought about whether we can make a, you know, and we'd taken an element of protein and broken it up into five or six chunks. Yeah. Those chunks were around the plate, you know, and the thought process with that is if you do that for somebody, yep. they can eat that chunk with all the bits and pieces you want them to eat with it because a plate of food is essentially designed to all go together. Yep. If you give them your protein and your carb and your veg all in one big pile, they've got to do that for themselves. And they might not. They might take their food and spread it all out and just eat the piece of potato on its own. And you're like, well, I wanted you to eat that bit of potato with yeah. that bit of edge because I think it'd be really nice. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, it ultimately dishes a design. It's so it, it all gets you going mm. rather than, I don't know what your, your kid is like at home, but my kids, mm. they want their food separate. Their palates just aren't. <laughs> if I put the food together, yeah. they split it all out on the plate. They'll eat one of their peas mm. and then they'll eat all their whatever it is. And, well, does that. Bit. <laughs> and I'm like, why, what, what, why would you do that? I mean, obviously cooking at home is very different to cooking yeah. at a restaurant, but in a restaurant, I'm guarantee you a chef wants you to try all of it mm. together. Yeah. Um, because they, they might be balancing stuff with sweet and sour and mm. salty, sugary, all those things that you need to get your taste buds flowing. Yeah. Uh, brilliant. Thank you very much for taking part of that. That's great stuff. The dish, the concept of the dish was to to think about, we've got a beautiful white plate, so we're just thinking about white and black and the colours that really stand off the plate. Yep. Um, I've got some peas and some broad beans because they're in season right now. Then I've gone with some sea vegetables. Um, we've got some marsh samphire. I've got a little bit of sea fennel and some sea purslane. 
Um, and then my garnish for that, I've got a little bit of daikon radish, which is just over here. Um, and then I've got some spare cured fish here. This is cured halibut that we've just that gently given a little bit of mm -hmm. a little bit of colour through. So again, you've got the black and the white texture on there. Um, in terms of placing this, uh, you won't see me with my tweezers, Tom. So we're gonna we're just gonna look at the middle of the plate, but I've just gone slightly off the middle of the plate with that. Mm -hmm. And we're, I'm thinking about creating the base. We talked about height earlier. Yep. Okay. And visual interest. Okay. Yeah. You'll notice I'm popping a little bit more just to this side because this is the side that we're going to create, that we're going to create a nice base for our fish. Yep. So that's the balance again. That's the balance. Yeah. And you'll also notice that I've left the top of the, 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 the radish that we've done, I've given it a nice little bit of colour. I've left that completely free there for now. Okay. Um, because I think that looks quite nice. It looks gorgeous. Then, so I've got opposing shapes there. Mm -hmm. I've got a rectangle and a square, but I've broken it up a little bit with some of the green. Yep. You see? Now, this, what's interesting with this one is I did think about whether we'd source down on the bottom of the plate, but I changed my mind as I started. <laughs> we may well play another one. This is very fluid, isn't it? While we're going. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So then I'm just looking at, I've got the key elements of my, my dish there. Yeah. The key elements that I want everybody to taste apart from my sauce. Uh-huh. What I need to do now is just finish it visually for how we're, for, for how I want it to look. So I've got some of my little sea herbs, but am I happy with what's going on over here? No, I'm not. So I'm just going to get my spoon and I'm just going to fill in a couple more there. Okay. A few more of our peas over there. And then maybe we'll just knock those about a bit over there and make them look a little bit random. And you know what? What about one of those just up on the top of there like that? We were talking about the, the visual side of it, yeah. weren't we? Um, and then I'm going to come back in another spoon. Well, it's a bit cl bit clackety, isn't it? That oh, okay. curved spoon. Let's just use sherry. We're all friends here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what about the dish itself? Is this a is this a new a new recipe for you? Is it? Yeah, or is this something well, that No, so the so there's ele there's elements within here that we've used before. Yeah. Um essentially what we had was a really beautiful sauce, mm -hmm. um, which you'll see in a minute, the black sauce. Um, and we that's made with that's made with a lovely fish stock base. Um and then the the halibut curing the halibut you get a much you get a really nice really interesting contrasting taste uh-huh what i'm doing now is just building up tom i'm not getting too carried away with throwing loads of stuff on all in go all in one go now when a dish is a little bit more practiced mm. like it would be in a kitchen like when we're in service i can do this all a lot quicker yep all right and i may even sort of naturally scatter bits and pieces around okay um but because we're plating for a picture, I can take my time here and create something a little bit nice. Yes, I'm really just going to show a little bit of a little bit of our sunfire as well. Mm -hmm. Is this guy you talked about the uh, ingredients from around here, the foraging stuff? Is there anything that's foraged in this? Uh, well, the sea herbs are, but not foraged around here. No, sea herbs will come with our fish supplier. Uh, we use a fish supplier down in yeah. Cornwall, Indian Queens, and they'll they yeah. have foragers that work in that area that will go out. I guess Reading does suffer from uh, not being hugely close to the sea. Not too close to the sea. No, but the, do you know what? There are processes that are used, yes. all right, that make it as good as, if not better. I can get fish here that's landed in the morning. I can get it here pretty much, well, through the middle of the night, and it's ready for me the following morning. Okay. This is our oil. Okay, so we're just going to fill a little... What kind of oil is it? Still oil. Still oil. So we're just going to follow a little bit of that. Coming colour, isn't it? Yeah. I'm just going to drop that into there. And then our sauce, mm. actually, so that I can create neat sourcing mm. and neat, it's in a bottle. So okay. we'll keep that nice and warm. Yep. And then we're just going to fill a little bit of sauce in and let it, what I would describe as puddle. Yeah. Oh, it really does, doesn't it? Just contrast so nicely. And then we can have a little look. Obviously, I'm looking at this dish from this side, mm -hmm. but if you were looking at it from on the top, yep. we might want to put a little bit more in there. When I'm sourcing anything, I'm always going to start right in the middle of the plate and I'm going to want that sourcing to happen. Uh -huh. I'm going to want the sourcing right in the middle so that, as I said to you when we were talking earlier, when you lash into that with your knife and fork, yep. you're going to get all of the flavours knocked in there together. Yep. I think we're okay with that. Okay. I don't think we need to fiddle around with it anymore. So that's 
that's cured fillet of halibut mm -hmm. with braised daikon radish. Um, we've got some peas and some broad beans. There's some sea purslane, some sea fennel, some marsh samphire, a um, little bit of dill oil to split out our seafood black uh, squid ink sauce. Well, Nick, it looks, it looks stunning. I'm going to put more of that in there because I want to eat that. All right, the good thing you get with the squid ink when it goes into the sauce is it mm. gives you a bit of body in the texture. So talking about the actual plating, yeah. you can see we've Please. come off the bottom of the plate a little yeah. bit. We haven't gone completely flat. I can actually plate another one in a minute and do a different style of plating with it. That would be good, too. yeah. Um, but we've come, we, we've given it height, mm -hmm. you know, by creating a base down underneath of peas and beans. We've got our radish there. We've got contrasting shapes, yep. which is interesting visually to the eye. Mm -hmm. And then what we haven't done is muck that up too much with the rest of what we've put down on the plate. Yep. We haven't mucked that up by kind of throwing it and covering it all over the top of it. It would be very easy to take a big wedge of samphire and chuck it right on the top then. Yep. Now, that'd be great for eating, yeah. but visually, maybe not so much. Yeah. All right. As a, as and a photographer, I'm like, please don't do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> please, all right? don't do that. please don't do that. So yeah. that's that one. That's brilliant.